Welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your host for Commission Ed. So, Colin, we are now bringing our audience the second part of this two-part series on the 17X career field with our special guest, Major Brian Thorne. Again, very grateful that you were able to secure this interview we've been trying for so long. Yeah, you give the gratitude to me, but man, isn't Brian freaking awesome? Yes. I mean, so much knowledge about comm and cyber. He's awesome. Yeah, so really excited. We're just going to get right to it. We'll uh, come back again on the back end of the interview and give you some more of our thoughts. But with that, let's turn it over to the second part of our interview. All right. So we've talked about some more stories. Um, we've talked about the career field. So let's talk about a little bit some of the training, some of the things to kind of expect as a 17X. Yeah. So if you're going to go to the Sierra route, kind of a typical route, you're going to go depending upon the amount of training you're going to do. So offensive, because of just the nature of those effects, mm -hmm. you're going to have a very long year and a half to two year pipeline. At least that's what it was when I went through. That may have changed. Is that all at Keesler? That's at different places. Okay. At different places. So you're going to have different places that you're going to be training uh, depending upon what units you're going to, but you've got a lot of training to go to. Yep. So expect commission. You're going to spend about nine months to a year at Keesler for training, and then you're going to spend a year, year and a half, et cetera, depending upon what the pipeline is in more training. So expect you're going to be a lot of training. That's okay, because what you're going to be doing as an offense is, like Colin was mentioning, you're making real effects. So you need that all that training. So just take it, run with it, do the best that you can with it. Yeah. Defense, you're going to have a little bit less training. You're going to have some more training coming out of that. You're going to have a variety of assignments there, whereas like offensive, you're going to have very specific locations. Defense, you can go pretty much anywhere lot of bases in the Air Force need defensive operators. So yeah. you have a lot more. more there's probably more of a demand than a, than a supply there right is, now. There is such a huge demand and there's such a small supply from yeah. there, which is why the network operations officers like me get thrown in there because there's just not enough of us. Yeah. Your probably first jobs, if you're on a share, you're going to be hopefully an operator, get to operate for a little bit, ideally at least a year. Hopefully you can get that. And then you're going to do, you're going to be a crew commander. They're going to want to put you as crew command for a while and have that. You're going to probably also do some other, they call them the back shops. So mm -hmm. like weapons and tactics, if you did really well, but well, you have to be an instructor first, sorry, like instructing on whatever your weapon system is. They're going to want you to evaluate. So like a true will go through, you'll evaluate what's the training correctly and then put you in a weapons tactics shop. So you're going to have a lot of different jobs within the three to four years there. One thing I always recommend to young officers is you want to do as many jobs as possible within yeah. your three to four years because you want that breadth of experience because that is going to literally prepare you for the rest of your career. Yep. I cannot emphasize them nothing. For me, my first assignment was in a space unit. I'm in Space Force right now. My first assignment set me up for the entire career right. in ways that I never knew that it would even happen. After your crew commander, you've done crew commanders, that's kind of your gates. You want to be a crew commander. You want to do stand eval and be an evaluator, get that training and certification, become an instructor, get that training and certification, do weapons and tactics, and then do a flight commander job. If you can do all of those within your first assignment or first two assignments, you're doing really well. Yeah. After that point, you're going to be going to squadron officer school. I'm at some point there, you want to see are there any other schools. If you can get, and this is for, I don't know if the Sierras can do right now, I know the Deltas can. At that kind of that point in your career, if you can get into the Expeditionary Warfare School, that's the Marine version of SOS, do it mm -hmm. because they're going to teach you how to plan complex operations. And we don't have any training like that in the Air Force or Space Force right now. So you need that because again, as an officer, you are planning, like we talked about earlier. Yeah. So anytime you can get planning training from the best, and the Marine Corps and the Army do it a lot better than we do, just from what I've seen on the cyber side, you really need that. So to jump for that. After you've come back, you want to, you're going to do probably a more flight commander. You may do an instructor tour and they try to at the 333rd. So going back to the schoolhouse, giving back, which is good. Might be a little frustrating at times. If you've been kind of go, 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 it's a little slower, but that's okay. You want that time. Yeah. Um, you may get into specialized teams that do some really fun stuff. Take advantage of that. And then, okay, you've been done. You've been team leads, you've been crew leads. Now it's time to start doing like 
can I be an assistant director in operation? I'm assistant director of operation, you're working with the DO and you're helping him or her with whatever special projects they need you to. Yeah. Roll into either ops officer job, director of operations job. So you're the squadron commander's right-hand man or woman to help out with operations. You're all responsible for that. And then if you're interested, you know, rolling into command and then group man, et cetera. Out yeah. there. And obviously you can be a squadron commander. You can be a group commander. What's the opportunity for general officer? Is there a it's, two star that is like the cyber operations officer so for 16th Air Force? Okay. We have general officer there. And then kind of beyond 16th Air Force, then it really gets limited for us. There's DISA, that's a joint billet. So you're competing with the other services. Can you be like the A26 or something like that? You'd be the A for us, A6 at a higher command. I don't know if we'd be the A36 because that's the ops or whatever the okay, ops is, yeah. but we would probably be the A6. A lot of times they'll call us either the A6 or the chief information officer. You can do that at some of the higher joint levels. Okay. And that's kind of where it goes. And so that's the Sierra side. The general officer side also similar for Delta. For Delta, if you're going to be either Comet.com or Network Operations, you're going to start it as an officer in charge of a small shop. Mm -hmm. It can be a variety of different, uh, you're going to have a mixture of seniors. Like I said, probably have a senior NCO to look out for you. You probably have a couple of NCOs, a couple of Airmen Guardians, depending if you're Air Force or Space Force, yeah. working a different amount of projects. Probably won't put you into plans and programs first. They'd like to get you, we I'd like to get you into <laughs> operations first because it's kind of hard to plan something if you have no experience with it. So right. I prefer having them have some ops experience first. That's just me. Different people do it reverse and that's fine. We get those ops experience first. So network operations, do your combat comm, go out in the field, do your TDYs, lots of TDYs out there, yeah. come back, get your kind of an unofficially like a deputy flight commander job. So you're working with, as a young CGO, you're working for probably a captain, a more senior captain that's guiding you a little bit on what they do. Get a flight commander job. You're going to go to SOS, go to try to expedition or warfare training. That's one thing that's unique to our AFSC as a 17 is that we can go to that school. Not all the AFSCs in the Air Force can. Yeah. So take advantage of that one. Take advantage of education with industry. That's huge. You know, that's not how the industry does things because especially in the cyber world, they do it totally different than we do. Yep. So you can learn a lot of best practices and bring that home. So at that captain stage, hopefully you've been an officer in charge of a small shop. You've been a flight commander. You've done the operations piece, whatever the operations is of your unit. You've yeah. done plans and programs to understand money and how that works. Now it's time to kind of spread your wings a little bit. And I'm going to go spend some time with the Marines. I'm going to go spend some time with industry. Yeah. I'm going to go maybe get a master's degree or a PhD with some of the advanced academic degree programs, which I highly recommend because that's your time to grow and think, okay, what other things can I add to my toolbox? Yep. Then you come back, you get close to be promoted to major, you can go to be an instructor at the schoolhouse. Maybe you can be an instructor at ROTC. You can go to be an instructor at OTS. Anytime you can be an instructor, I highly recommend it because that is now becoming an important gate in our career field. Yeah. By gate, that's a milestone that they want to see that you have. I know people who've done all of them, like I know you have, you need, as an officer, jump on those opportunities. It used to be that instructor tour, like, eh, that's not the thing. You learn how to teach. You learn how to speak. But you also learn that how much you don't know. Oh, yeah. And that's true. As you remember, you know, the students are going to ask you questions and you're like, <laughs> I never thought about that one. Yeah. I'm going to get back to you, right? It grows you as a person, as an individual. And so you need that time. So if the opportunity comes up to be an instructor, you need to jump on that. Is it going to be tough? Yes. Is there going to be long hours, you know, short weekends, all that fun stuff? Yes. But it is totally worth it because you're going to be a much better person, much better officer, much better understanding of whatever it is. If it's, you're doing ROTC or OTS, you understand the Air Force a lot better. If you teach at the cyber schoolhouse, you understand cyber a whole lot better because um, you're interacting with people from all the backgrounds. And so you'll come in and, and I'll say, oh, I use this acronym. And they're like, well, we use that same acronym, but it's for this. Yeah. And so we have all kinds of discussions like, well, you did OCO. How did you guys do it? And well, we did this in space. And what did you guys do in the air world? That's interesting. What did you guys do in DCO? So you're sharing all that common knowledge, one of the benefits of instructor. Yeah. And then after instructor of the Delta side, you're going to go, they're going to try to get you into a, a DO position, um, director operation position. Now with us, um, this is all Air Force, by the way. I can talk about Space Force in a bit. Air Force, you can also be a squadron commander as a major. Okay. 
Good to know. And that's a little terrifying. It's exciting, but it's also terrifying, right? Because I know people who've done like squadron command as a major, and then they turn right around and become a squadron commander again as a lieutenant colonel, because mm-hmm. there's just not enough of us. And then so on the recent list that I saw of command, I saw a lot of my friends who are majors right now. You could be a commander of a full squadron, commander of attachment, which is kind of like a partial squadron. But that's really important to know that I conceivably, if I was still in the Air Force, potentially I would be a commander. And I've been in for 12 years and being a commander, having the G-series orders, which determines, gives you the ability to do discipline and yep. everything. That's a lot. That's a lot. And I'm in my 30s and that, that's a lot of experience. But again, <laughs> right, you got to be ready. You got to be You're ready. ready for it. So as the majority of the listeners are probably going to go Air Force. And if you've been in for 12 years or so, it's squadron command time. You got to be ready for there. So I highly emphasize as that captain, if you've learned all those parts of the jobs, learn as many jobs, whatever, how many jobs your squadron has, you try to learn every single one. You do some type of career broadening right at the end of your CGO time mm-hmm. so that when you hit FGO, it's go time. Yeah. I mean, it's go time at CGO, but it's really go time as FGO. Like they expect, you know it, you've been in for a while, it's time to, you're going to be in a leadership position or they're going to put you in a heavy project, which is involve lots of money. Yeah. Like they expect you to know these things. So you need to take their CGO time seriously to learn as much as possible. I know, I think sometimes we do a disservice when we say, and I've said it many times too myself, that you know, LTs don't know anything. And it's true, but we can't just leave it at that. Right. We have to say, okay, you don't know anything. What are you taking the time to learn so you overcome that? Like, are you finding the good seat your NCO to, to mentor you? Are you finding the commander? Are you finding you know, the DO or someone there that can mentor you so that when you do reach captain and you know you, that switch is flipped and okay, now we hold you responsible for everything. Are you ready for that? Right. I know like for me with the lieutenants that I work with now, I was thinking about it because a lot of them are about to PCS, the experienced ones. And I was like, I never gave them the opportunity to actually be LTs in the traditional sense. I basically said, you're here and I need you to be the expert. Go. Yeah. From the deal looking at them, I think they had a lot tougher LT experience than I did because I had the, <laughs> the LT didn't know anything. I didn't give them that. So I don't know. I'm curious if I ever get that feedback from them and then ask them how they handled that. But because I wanted them to learn Fast and I and I know because I have several very bright CGOs and I'm hoping if they decide to make this a career, they can go far. It's like I know what's ahead of you. I know how tough it can be. And so I want you to have a little bit tougher right now. Yeah. So that when you're higher up, you're like, Oh, I've dealt with this before. I know that. I know how to do this, having tough bosses and how to answer all these tough questions. Yeah. Well, I don't know them. I haven't talked to them, but I'm going to speak for them anyway. <laughs> I think you've done them a favor. I think you did the right thing in turning up the heat right out the gate and helping them to mold into the kind of the officer that uh, you needed them to be for the squadron, that the Air Force and the Space Force needs them to be as they move on to their next assignment. And I think that that is a good place to kind of bring this all home. I want to talk about the return of near-peer competition and the role of cyber and communications as we face near peers like Russia and China, who are both very good right. in this arena. What are you encouraging people who are not yet lieutenants or brand new lieutenants or, you know, shoot, even FGOs like you and me? Right. What are the things that we need to be aware of or reading or you know, platforms that we need to get off of? Hashtag TikTok. Right. right. Yes. Yes, please. <laughs> what are the things that you are seeing from your perspective that would better prepare officers or future officers to operate in a contested, congested, near peer environment? So I would say one of the things we need to know now is you have to take the training. If you're a young lieutenant, I'll kind of talk about the different categories. So let's say a young lieutenant undergraduate cyber warfare training. You need to take the planning part seriously. Okay. You need to take that seriously. So as a major right now, if I'm getting a brand new CGO, I need to know that they know how to plan. And especially if they just came out of undergraduate cyber warfare training, I'm going to expect you already know how to plan. Mm. Now, are you an expert? No. But do you know the basics? You better because that's my understanding is what the schoolhouse is teaching. So you need to take that seriously. You need to take the technical aspects, understanding the jargon. We put the officers through the exact same training as the enlisted, right? right. Trying to copy, we're not Navy SEALs, but trying to copy that mindset. Like if you're an operator, you're an operator, which means you need to be able to do the exact same training mm-hmm. regardless if you're officer and enlisted. So you need to take the technical part seriously right. at undergraduate cyber warfare training. If you blow it out of the water and it's easy for you, that's awesome. But that's not everyone. So if you struggle with it now, you need to ask questions. You need to figure out where do I struggle? Why am I struggling here? And then up the game so that when you get to your operational unit, when we send you through the training pipelines, you can you be ready to rock and roll. Because I need you as an officer coming to your operational unit ready to lead and to speak the technical side. Yeah. And if you say, well, sir, I don't really know, that's not going to work for me. I need you to say, I don't know, but I know how to get it or I'm going to go learn it. 
So that's for like a young CGO. Yeah. What I need you guys, what I need them to learn. For a high schooler right now, I would say anytime you use an app, you need to know where it comes from. Mm-hmm. So TikTok, are you reading any of the apps of what's going on with that? You really need to. There was that Russian app that we had a while back. I think you send a lot of pictures and it shows the face app, the face app right yeah. in there. You're, like, you know, you're giving all those pictures of your life. What's that facial recognition? Every time you use an app, who made it? Where is the data coming from? Are you actually reading when they say, okay, here's the privacy. Here's what we do with privacy. Here's what we do with third party. Here are the cookies that we use, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Like, are you actually reading those agreements or are you just clicking and saying, click, I want to go use the app? Are you looking like location services? What apps are tracking where you're going or are tracking or have access to all of your pictures? A lot of apps that like social media apps, they automatically have access to everything unless you go through and specifically say, here's what you can and cannot access on my phone. Yeah. They're just going to take it all. And if you're not paying attention, so as a high schooler, take that seriously. Yep. What apps do I have on my phone? Where do they come from? What am I doing with that information? What is what are other people doing with that information? If you're interested as a high schooler in doing cyber warfare, there's Cyber Patriot, one of the big exercises right now that mm-hmm. I believe it's an ROTC that you can get involved with, that you can learn how to hack and everything, looking at asking your school if they have a comp site program, what type of things you can get into either during school hours, after school hours. Um, same thing at, uh, similar at colleges. A lot of colleges, if you're in the computer science, you kind of a club there. There are plenty of competitions that you can do all across the road. Capture the flags. You can just kind of Google capture the flags in my area, capture the flag exercises. There's yeah. always capture the flags around that you can get involved in. So learning as a high schooler in college age, if you're really interested, getting involved in that. I think that's really important from there. From the near peer side and learning like from our adversaries and Russia and China, they've taken the warfare side in cyber very seriously. I think a lot earlier, at least outwardly, overtly, a lot earlier than what we have. So you need to understand that when you're using the network, when you're using the internet, either on my phone or my laptop or whatnot, they're there too. It's not like it's your private home internet that no one else sees. It's everyone's there at the same time. So you need to be conscious of that, that it is a place where there, it's like the matrix but agent smith is all around right i mean he's there you may not see him but he's there mm-hmm. so you need to be aware and yes it'd be cool if that was how cyber warfare really worked uh, it's not but it, i but, know kung but, fu i know right uh, but learning right taking that seriously and, and being mindful that there are adversaries out there that are looking at your information and then when it comes to like you said reading for just general, um, there's a book called It's Dark Territory, I think by Fred Kaplan, really good about the history of cyber warfare and mm-hmm. the NSA, and that was very insightful. There's a book, Sandworm, that's really good about a Russian advanced persistent threat and what they've done. There's Countdown to Zero Day about Stuxnet, really big. It's technical, but it also is written for those of us like me who are arguably not as technical yeah. to understand is the complexity of developing a cyber weapon and what that means yeah. and what the kind of the costs are after you send a cyber weapon out. For us, I know like I read lots of articles about like cyber deterrence mm-hmm. and people debate back and forth about cyber deterrence. And I think the countdown to zero to just a good job of explaining if you send it's code is code. It doesn't just blow up yeah. not like a nuclear bomb. So as an officer, yes, as a CGO, maybe it's not on our role, but kind of thinking if you're a software developer and you're developing something, if you send it out to the wild, right, to the rest of the internet, who's going to take that code and turn it and maybe use it back at us? Right. Yeah, yeah think about that. Yeah, because it doesn't disappear. It doesn't disappear. It does not disappear hmm. at all from there. So reading these books about cyber warfare in the past, if you're interested in cyber warfare, literally just Googling cyber warfare, like Ukraine, a lot of examples. Yep. There's plenty of examples on CBS, on C4ISRnet, uh, which is a great place, by the way, C4ISRnet. It talks about like cyber command has been engaging, but are you reading day-to-day news about what's going on in the cyber warfare piece. Yeah. There's a free, it's called the early bird brief, yep. uh, free. So perfect. I love it. I read it every day. Highly recommend that. If high school, college, active duty, if you're in the military now, you need to be reading this. If you want to get in the military, you need to be reading this right now yeah. because it's going to give you a good highlight. And especially on the cyber side, here's some highlights. But you also need to spend time on your own reading on it. There's the, what did Russia do with Georgia and Estonia? several years ago with warfare and how they took out Georgia and Estonia during that time. But then how Estonia has grown and become yep. one of the cyber security experts of the world right, right. now. Estonia so is amazing. So you know, are you studying like, well, what from Estonia can we learn? What from Georgia can we learn? What from the lessons of the past can we learn? What are kind of common attacks? Again, all this is open and available on Google. You literally just have to Google it, go cyber warfare, what the country 
and you can learn cyber example, cyber warfare experience. So I, I would ask that you do that either as an officer or as a student preparing for that so that when you get through the training and you're bogged down in the training, you're in that long pipeline or whatnot, yeah. like, why am I doing this? You can go back and think of those historical examples. And go, Oh, I'm doing this because of this or that. And I need to make sure that I'm prepared. If I'm on the defensive side, this is what I could be up against. Or if I'm on the offensive side, what are some of the consequences? If I'm giving those effects, yeah, can this customer come back? See, this is why I asked the question, because it's not just the cyber operations officers that need to be aware of this stuff. Right, The cyber domain affects every single one of us because we interact with it every single day. Absolutely. Right? But I'm so concerned that because it's not like a typical domain that we're used to in terms of like land, we see it, we feel it, water, ocean, we can see it, feel it, air. You know, we love airplanes. Right. <laughs> That's why we yep. all join the Air Force. Exactly. You know, and it's kind of similar to the space domain. It's like people don't have an appreciation for it because right. they don't live in it. Right. But even more so because of cyber, because we made it. Right. Yes. You know? And so people don't necessarily take it seriously. They don't. Because it's not tangible. Right. But then, therefore, it requires that much more concentrated yes. and deliberate effort for you yes. to protect yourself. Yes. Not just yourself, but airmen and guardians that you work yep. with, your friends and family, you know, protect the mission, get the mission done and all that. Because choices that you make with how you interact with the cyber domain can have very serious adverse effects for you personally, for those people that you care about on the mission itself. And so we got to take this more seriously, right? Very much so. Very much so. And this is where understanding reading articles, I think helps because you understanding the threats that are out there. And I'll give a great example, like ransomware. Mm -hmm. Ransomware is huge right now. Yeah. A lot of people are worried about ransomware. As a listener, do you know what ransomware is? Do you know how it happens? It's really easy. You click on a bad link and your computer's locked up. And that's literally all that happens. Right? And I know people who that's happened to. Yep. They just click on a bad link or bad article and there we go. So being mindful, reading those articles, going, okay, what am I doing? Knowing like when, as you're looking through your emails, and seeing, I get, unfortunately, lots and lots of spam. You know, whenever you sign up for something, it seems like you sign up for that thing, but then tons of more spam comes in and it's all articles trying to steal, it's trying to basically malware. Being careful of what websites you go to. Yep. Knowing that you can click on something and you're opening the door to let people, let people come in. Really dangerous. So being mindful of that when you download an app or when you're using Facebook or any social media, when your friends get hacked... And they, they send you, oh, I've been hacked. My password's been hacked and stuff. Does that cause you to pause and think, what do I need to do? Yeah. Like, is my password okay? Like, have you looked online and that, what makes a good password? And that's easy. Just Google, yeah. what makes a good password? Am I using a password manager? What am I doing to keep myself safe? Or am I doing like one, two, three, or password or God or whatever? No, don't use simple passwords. How much information do you give up? on your social media mm -hmm. that makes it super easy for me, especially if you leave your email address on social media. Yep. And while I have that, so that's probably your username for the majority of things you have. Mm -hmm. If you tell me what you do or have all like your life story on social media, I can answer probably the majority of the questions on how to change your password and I'm in. And now I have your accounts. Yep. And if you don't have two-factor authentication, bye. Yeah. Like, it's mine. Asking for it's trouble. Mine. So, and there's simple things. You're Googling it. You're learning it. You're being mindful. Are you looking out for your friends? If one of your friends on social media and you see that they're posting really weird stuff, mm -hmm. are you checking in on your friend and going, hey, are you okay? Also, you're posting some really strange stuff that's not like you. Is this you or is someone take your account? Letting them know. Don't just automatically assume someone knows that their account's been hacked. Because right. a lot of times they don't know. They may, but they may not. So being mindful, helping your friends out with this and teaching them, if you're really good, if you love this stuff and you're all about it, are you telling your friends? Because yeah. a lot of people don't know and they don't care as much because they don't know that they should care. And that's one of my big things with trying to talk to different groups of people is saying, hey, here's some of the basic stuff you can do to keep you safe. Are you going to get hacked? It's possible. Yes, it is absolutely possible. Yeah. Because offense normally wins. They just need to find one loophole and they're in. But if you can try to make yourself not as hard a target, that helps. Well, gosh, you know, this hasn't been the happiest discussion <laughs> that we've ever had, but you know, it's so important. Yeah, people need to understand cyber, especially if they want to go into this career field, yes. be aware of what they're going to be dealing with. But, you know, for all of us to recognize our interaction with the cyber domain, to appreciate the cyber warriors that are out there protecting us and, you know, trying to deliver those effects on our behalf. So been a really great discussion. Obviously, there's so much more that we could cover. 
But if people need to get more information, if they are eager to learn about the differences in training, the opportunities that are available, both in the 17 Delta and the 17 Sierra, if they are curious about the differences between being in the Air Force versus the Space Force and, and how comm or cyber operates within those, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Have them email me. We can go from there. That's perfect. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd love to answer the questions. Cool. Yeah. So just email us to airforceofficerpodcast at gmail.com and we'll make sure that that gets forwarded on to you, Brian. Perfect. Well, very good. This has been fascinating. Awesome. It's been harrowing. It's been <laughs> exciting. It's been up and down all over the place, you know, cyber and calm. It seems like where things are happening right very now. Very much so. Very much so. Yeah, it makes it exciting. And that, especially with the Russia-Ukraine, paying attention from a cyber perspective and thinking when we read those articles of what is Russia doing, what is Ukraine doing, the lessons that Ukraine learned, what Russia did with Georgia and Estonia, the fact that Cyber Command has said openly, we're helping. That's big. Most yeah. of the time that wouldn't happen. Yeah. From the information operations side that ties into cyber and intel and multi-domain, how President Biden beforehand was telling the world before Russia invaded, here's what Russia's going to do. Here's what yep. Russia's going to do. That's all that, that cyber, that space, that's air, that's everyone, that's intel all coming together. So knowing as a high schooler, you're starting to read, becoming smarter right now. And then as the cadet, be it you know, ROTC Academy, OTS, whatnot, continuing to read. And so how do I fit in the larger picture? Because as you saw, as we're seeing right now in Russia and Ukraine, every domain is impacted in one way, shape or form. Yeah. Space, Starlink. Starlink's been huge, yeah. right? With SATCOM, it's been huge in there. And how the cyber side and Russia hacking into Viasat. So that's why one of the reasons why we went to Starlink and, and the relationship between, again, this is why I mentioned um, education with industry, EWI, the relationship between the commercial sector and the military. Mm -hmm. That is huge so and taking advantage of that opportunity. And it's the future. That is 100% the future. Yep. Absolutely. So it's exciting. Long gone are the days where all of the, quote, best things, the military grade right. kind of stuff came from the military. Absolutely. We can't do it ourselves. No. We got to rely even more so on our commercial partners. Heavily so. Well, Brian, this has been fantastic. We got one more question for you. You've already touched on this multiple times, but hey, let's condense it down to a nice soundbite for the audience. What does it mean to be an officer? So as an officer, I would say that it's your job to empower and advocate. I would also say that as an officer, you need to learn how to adjust your leadership philosophy depending upon the needs of the moment. My leadership philosophy has changed. Sometimes it's been, let's do the little things right if I was in a training setting. Sometimes it's been, I'm just here just to keep the ship steady because I was in a job for only about six months before my replacement came. So I was just there to help. Here right now, it's you know, empower and advocate. You have to be flexible to the needs of the moment, but you have to have a leadership philosophy, but it has to be based upon what your unit needs because ultimately you're there to, again, I'll use right now, empower your troops to do their job and you need to be able to be there to advocate on their behalf because if you don't, no one else will. And you have that rank, you have a voice, you need to use that. And you're going to be using that voice maybe in military stuff. You might be using that voice as I've used with very personal stuff. They're going to come to you if they trust you and they're going to tell you things that yeah. they're not going to tell anyone else. And you have to figure out how do I empower this person to go to the chaplain or to go to mental health or yep. not? How do I advocate on this person's behalf? Because they're telling me things that, okay, how do I tell that to the commander? And how do I tell that to other people? Where is my lines, the legal authority side? Mm -hmm. Where's my lens fit? So knowing that as an officer is huge. And that's where the first sergeant can help you with there. That's where the chaplain can help you with there. And that's where you're a good senior NCO, your chief or your uh, master sergeant, senior master sergeant can help you with there. But that's kind of bottom line. You're there to empower and advocate, figure out how you're going to do that based upon your assignment. Absolutely. I know Mac would approve. Brian, this has been really fantastic. Again, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you for taking the time to share your knowledge, your passion for the cyber and the communications career fields. And, you know, I encourage our members of the audience to get in touch with you if they have additional questions. Do you have anything else that you want to leave the audience with? From a leadership perspective, so reading, right, one of the best books I've read recently is Legacy mm -hmm. uh, by James Kerr about the New Zealand All Blacks. Yep. Phenomenal book. You have to read it. If you want to be an officer, regardless of the AFC, regardless of the Space Force Special Code, you need to read it because that will change the way. Those 15 rules will change the way how you lead and how you view and create a culture. It's phenomenal. So highly recommend Legacy by James Kerr. Highly recommend that book. Awesome. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, Reed. So they've now heard the full interview, everything that Brian had to say about the career field, the development of the communications, the cyber operations officer, two very distinct and really important missions, 
right? Not the same thing, which is why they were split out, different focuses, but very important to everything that we do. Got to be able to communicate, got to have the network, got to be able to operate and defend in the cyber domain. But before we get more into what all that means, I want to talk about the approach that Brian has had in his most recent assignment while he's been the DO. He mentioned about how he's been expecting more of his lieutenants than say what was expected of him or maybe even you and me and kind of that default perspective that people have about the butter bar that somebody who has authority but no experience nothing really to bring to the fight they're an empty vessel that needs to be filled right but brian is coming at it differently he's like nah you guys have the responsibility to be the subject matter expert and i'm going to treat you as such so giddy up right yeah yeah. And I'm a big fan, big fan of that perspective. I have kind of always felt that you should treat someone like they can become, not like they are. And before you blink your eyes too many times, those butter bars are going to be captains. Yeah. The expectation is you are delivering, you are operating. So what were you doing with the previous four years if you were just dismissing them? That's the way I, I exactly. kind of view it. Yeah. yeah. So huge fan. I love that development perspective. I mean, we've talked about this previously, like if we were the kings of the day, if we had that magic wand and we had the ability to just like completely redo the commissioning process, the accessions process for officers, what would we do? We would make all of them go through BMT, right? Everybody would enlist first. They would spend at least two years enlisted before they would get their first look at even being an officer. And then once they are an officer, they've got a long commissioning process to go through, you know, six months or so at the Air Force Academy in an OTS high pressure cooker sort of environment, and then extend the lieutenant time, right? Yeah, exactly. You're a butter bar, you're a second lieutenant for three years. Mm -hmm. Same thing for a first lieutenant for three years. Before you ever put on captain, you've been in at least eight years, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. That all sounds wonderful. Obviously isn't the case right now and may never be. So we got to operate within the situation that we have now, which is you've got people who sometimes are an empty vessel, come in, walk in off the street, no prior military experience whatsoever. All they have is a bachelor's degree and they are every bit as much of a lieutenant as the 15 year master sergeant who has had this plan in place, working on it for the last 10 years to get selected through OTS, they've been just absolutely crushing it, but only now got the time and the opportunity to commission because it's that competitive. Both of those people wear the exact same rank. Yes. You cannot treat them exactly the same, or maybe you can, and you should treat them at a higher level, have higher expectations from them. Yeah. They'll surprise you. They will surprise you. Mm -hmm. And I've found that not only in my officer career, but I found that, you know, I've been in, involved with Boy Scouts for a long time. If you yeah. treat 12-year-olds like 12-year-olds, they will be 12-year-olds. Yeah. If you give them a little more responsibility, you'll be surprised. And sometimes they won't. Sometimes they'll drop the ball. But I expect that of my lieutenants. I expect mm -hmm. some growth, some learning, some, yeah, that didn't work out. But that's the point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's have those reps. Let's have those mistakes when they're, quote, just a butter bar, so that when it's time to operate, and Colin, you and I have talked about this, Yeah, the difference between a lieutenant and a captain is vast when oh, yeah. it comes to the way you're treated. When you do anything good as a lieutenant, people are like, oh, hey, <laughs> yeah, good job, right? You do like the- Like they're surprised. Yeah, yeah. You do another good thing as a captain, no one says a word. Yeah, and the difference may be like three days difference. Like yeah. you were a lieutenant, you know, three days prior, you promoted somewhere in there. Now you're captain and it's instantly different. Yeah. That's just the expectation. Bang. That's it. <laughs> yeah. So let's not do that. Let's give them an opportunity to fail. Let's give them an opportunity to grow and treat them like they can become. And I think it, yeah. we'd all be better for it. Well, and I think the last piece of the conversation is who are we talking to? Who is it that is treating the lieutenant as the empty vessel? I think it's three different categories of people. One, the people like you and me, the officers, the quote, more senior officers, the FGOs, who are responsible, direct supervisors of these lieutenants, right? We need to have a higher expectation of them, just like Brian is for his lieutenants, right? 
So that's the first group. The second group is the senior NCO and the NCO core, the folks who buy the book. You know, in the Brown book, it says that the senior NCOs are the people who are most directly responsible for the growth, development, maturation, the mentoring of lieutenants, because they're kind of at that same level, you know, in terms of responsibility and authority, definitely not an experience, right? Yeah. So senior NCOs, NCOs, definitely be treating your lieutenants, you know, holding them to a higher standard. Yeah. And then the third group, maybe, you know, everybody's already thinking this, but just want to pull it out. Anyway, the lieutenants themselves, Mm -hmm. they need to treat themselves, hold themselves to a higher standard, right? Yeah, exactly. Totally agree. Yeah. Huge fan of that, of that point. I'm glad we addressed it for the audience. So the thing that he brought up that I wanted to touch on is something that I've been thinking about for a very long time. Yeah. Ever since they created the different competitive categories for promotion, line of the Air Force A, line of the Air Force I, which is information warfare, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and all the various categories, it really kind of sunk in. So I'm line of the Air Force I, information warfare, and they grouped in PA, weather, cyber, and intel. And I maybe even be missing one, but those are the ones that they grouped together. So you and Brian are in the same competitive category uh, mm-hmm. category for promotion. Yeah. Okay. And, it, and now that overlap had been there for a while, right? So at headquarters Air Force, it's the A26. So formerly General O'Brien, soon to be General Lauterbach, if that's not already done by the time this episode airs, she is the A26. So yeah. she's got both hats. That's been for a while. And additionally, 14 ends, Intel officers can command certain cyber squadrons yep. and vice versa. So it's not uncommon to have a 17 in a Intel squadron uh, because of the massive amounts of overlap. So that's been happening for a while, but it wasn't until that really crystallized for me that information is warfare. Yeah, It's been something that I've been really thinking about, been um, planning to do some writing on, been doing some studying, and some things that you guys talked about, right? Like he mentioned two-factor authentication. I live in a skiff, so I can't have my phone with me. So two-factor authentication is actually a huge pain in the neck, but yet I have to do it. And something happened to me just yesterday. So I put a bicycle up on Facebook Marketplace, and within five minutes, I had two different scammers trying to scam me out of $500 by using a Zelle scam where, hey, you know, I've sent you the money. Oh, I don't, I haven't received the money yet. So they're like, oh yeah, well, go check your spam email. So there's this spam email. It's like very carefully crafted. It looked great. That said, oh, you need to raise your limit. Have the buyer send you an additional $500 and then the money will come through. I'm like, nope, I can see how this is going to go. They're going to say, okay, now I need my $500 back. I send them a real $500. I never get my 200 bucks. Everything's, you know, like I can see this. Yeah, And it it made me feel like I was in the Wild West again, right? In the OK Corral, and I have to have a sidearm on my hip every time I Mm -hmm. step out into the cyber world. It's kind of the Wild West a little bit. The policy, the law, the habits, the experience, you know, the life lessons haven't happened, haven't caught up to where the technology is. And it's a little bit of a dangerous place. And yeah. it was just a fascinating thing because my mind has already been there. You guys talked about Russia, Ukraine, cyber, information warfare. Man, I've been there for a while. This is definitely of high interest to me. Yeah. I mean, let's talk about what the cyber domain, this Wild West entity space, you know, what is it? Like, where is these interactions and this lawlessness, this lack of policy and etiquette exist? We're talking about a man-made war fighting domain You know, it's a domain just as every bit as much as land, sea, air. It's got its own kind of like terrain. And, you know, there are high points, low points, mountains, valleys, you know, choke points, and all these different things that you would use to describe a typical physical domain that we live and operate in, right? Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing, again, is that the cyber domain is man-made. We made it, right? Yeah. And unless we're continually keeping it there we will lose access to it. Yeah. Yet, we also, even if we lose access to it, we are still subject to its effects. 100%. And that's kind of what I want to talk about is like the effects that happen inside the cyber domain by comparison to, say, the land domain. Brian, you know, when he was instructing my class, he talked about if you drop a bomb 
on land from the air. That bomb explodes and, you know, the effect of the bomb is still there, but the bomb itself is gone. It's not something that the enemy can then go pick up and exploit. I mean, they can try to reverse engineer a little bit. You know, depending, you know, on frag patterns, you know, the things that they were able to piece together from it. But by and large, especially over time, as weather and other things impact that area, the ability to learn something from that weapon disappears. But that's not true in the cyber domain. You know, he talks about how code doesn't disappear. If you choose to employ a weapon, such as like a zero day weapon, you know, exploiting some sort of bug or gap in a piece of software, if you use that code, it stays there. It doesn't disappear. Yes, the effects are there, but the code itself, the weapon itself that you used is still there. And the enemy can grab it, use it, repurpose it, learn a whole bunch of things, build upon it, and then turn it back on us. Right? Yeah. And that's just in like the war fighting perspective. The same is also true just in day-to-day life. I mean, how many times have we beat the drum here about being aware of your internet usage, your digital footprint, especially on platforms like TikTok or the other social media? Like you mentioned uh, Facebook Marketplace, like the enemy's there, like they're literally there. And in some cases, especially for like TikTok, they designed it. Yeah. And you're entering into their domain, their cyber domain, where anything that you do lives literally forever. Yeah. It does not disappear. Code does not disappear, even if it's just innocuous, like stuff like, you know, searching on Google. Mm -hmm. Your search history persists forever. I just don't think that enough people are recognizing these facts. Yeah. Yeah. And to go back to my Wild West analogy, you should be carrying a proverbial sidearm in this Wild West. Yeah. But if you don't know that that's the space you're in, you're not going to be doing that. He talked, Mm -hmm. you know, we'd mentioned it already, two-factor authentication. There's a bunch of things you can and should be doing. But this opens up a bunch of things I'm thinking a lot about, right? So whose job is it to defend the information warfare space? Where does the border between American territory and foreign Mm -hmm. begin? What role does the Department of Defense have in that? I mean, it goes on and on and on. I've, like I said, I've got many emails to myself with all these notes and thoughts. But yeah, this is, and every single person is a combatant, whether they think they are or not. You know, we've talked about this. Every like, every tweet, every retweet, every post, every cross post, it's all coming to be a part of the milieu of what is information warfare. I'm a trained professional at bringing in a lot of information assessing a value of that information and then attributing some score, some level, some degree of truth to what we think is actually going on. Yeah. I think more people need that training. Just right now, Colin, if you were to go try to find the origin of a quote that you'd seen somewhere, (laughs) that is almost impossible. Yeah, we've talked about this. Yeah. So what is truth? Where did it come from? How do you make decisions? Yeah, especially if your default is to look for the truth on the internet. Which, can we blame people? No. I do that all the time. I teach my kids how to, you know? So this is all stuff that, now that it's a warfighting domain, and it is, promise, Mm -hmm. in case there's any question, yeah, what role do we have? What role should we have? And I hope there's really smart people thinking more about this than me, because the more I peel back these layers, the more I realize there's a lot here. Yeah. And the thought that's coming to my mind right now is you said that every person is a combatant. So not just every uniform wearing person in the military is a combatant, but like, you know, mom and pop, grandma, grandpa, minors, adolescents, you know, children who have internet access starting even at like age three, you know, watching YouTube, right? Yeah. Something along those lines. They are participating. They are engaged in this war fighting domain. Yeah. And I think it's always been that way. It's just the pervasiveness and speed and scope of the connectedness has changed, right? Let's go way back when to medieval times, right? 
you know, someone would come into town and like put up an advertisement that says, you know, the king is declaring war on insert name of adversary here. Yeah. The town, the few people who can read it, tell their neighbors. And now everyone knows that insert adversary here. These are the bad people that has had an influence. Information has been shared. The difference now is the speed and the depth, the number, the frequency, and the ability of others to inform, you know, other people. Before, only the king could afford it. Yeah. Now, you can literally start a war in your proverbial grandma's basement if you've got the right knowledge and the right tools. I I mean, it's doable. Yeah. The barrier to entry to participate and engage and have real effects in the domain has dropped dramatically, even just in the last couple of years. I mean, the domain itself is not that old. You know, I don't know the exact year that Al Gore invented the internet, but it hasn't been around as long as land. Yes, agreed. (laughs) Right? It's a very, very new technology and domain, and hence the Wild Westness of it. Yeah, exactly. So before we, you know, start season four, five, six, and seven, talking about information warfare, (laughs) um, you know, we should probably, you know, start wrapping it up. Amazing stuff. Really grateful that Brian came on and really opened our eyes to this field that we've been trying to bring to you for a long time. I suspect we're going to get a lot of questions. Keep them coming. You know, send us some emails, engage with us on our various social media platforms. I'm confident that Brian will answer your questions and really, you know, help us all grow and develop as we learn more about this amazing and and fascinating field. Yeah. So much important information has been shared here by Brian. And I highly encourage if you do have those questions, reach out to him through us. We'll put you in touch with either him or somebody who has answers or, you know, because it's so new, because everything is Wild West, we will do our best with the limited information that is actually available. Don't be afraid of the internet, right? Don't be afraid to engage with us. Don't be afraid to participate in the war, right? But just be aware. And that's what we ask here, right? Brian is a great resource for that. And uh, we thank him and we encourage you all to reach out to him. Anything else for you, Reed? Nope, that'll do it for this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.